Alrighty. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. It's so awesome to see everybody again. Um, this is Cloud Native London. Just to check, you're in the right place. So we're going to be on Twitter with Cloud Native Lun tonight. Uh, cloud Native London is a strong, open, diverse developer community around cloud native technologies based in London. Um, I'm Cheryl. I'm the director of ecosystem at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is the home of Kubernetes, Prometheus, and lots of other technologies in this space. You can find me on Twitter at Oi Cheryl. Um, this is a very early preview, but this is something I've been working on. So Kubernetes Community Days London is coming on the 3rd and 4th of September. So I'm excited. It's going to be basically this, but 1,500 people. So this is, this is where we're going to be. It's in Westminster. It's an awesome venue. Um, you can check out this link to register if you want to come and attend. We're looking for speakers, sponsors, all the usual stuff. But mark it in your calendar. We'll be 3rd and 4th of September. Uh, another conference announcement, DevOps Days is looking for speakers as well. So their CFP is open for until the 24th of March. No, 24th of May. Sorry, dummy. OK, back to you tonight. So we've got three really awesome speakers. So Byron, yeah, Byron is going to be the first person up to speak. He's going to talk about cheesy analogies. Inez is second. She's going to talk about disaster recovery in the cloud. And then Jai, who is, should be somewhere here, went for a smoke. Went for a smoke. Uh, <laughs> OK, awesome. <laughs> is going to come and talk about his experiences as an SRE. And then at 9 o'clock, we're going to wrap up and go to the Draft House pub around the corner for the next couple of hours. Um, if you would like to come and speak, we're now pretty much tracking 12 months in, adva like in advance, so there is a link to sign up. Uh, you can plan for next year. Uh, thank you for our sponsors. So Technovo, come down and say a few words. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan from Technovo, last minute edition, it's supposed to be Kevin who, uh, all, who checked you all in. Uh, Technovo, a digital consultancy, um, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about us, just come and grab me afterwards. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, Contino, anybody from Contino here? Was that a yes? No? Okay, uh, in that case... I was hoping to be able to read out their blurb, but my phone's not loading it. So, um, Contino, a very nice consultancy. <laughs> Pusher. Anyone from Pusher here tonight? Okay. Pusher do real-time data processing workflows. X Matters do a digital availability platform. Something like that. Okay, Humio, Humio, no? Humio do log data, I'm com like logging, I'm confident about this one. Palo Alto Networks. Quite possibly, in Palo Alto, in fact. They do security, yeah. Sousa, Sousa. Sousa is here, I, someone want to say a word? So okay, Susa do a very shy Linux, okay? And D2 IQ. Okay, D2 IQ are Mesosphere rebranded, so. They, it stands for Day 2 IQ, which makes some sense. Uh, and I also want to thank all the people who actually helped me th put this on. So today, due to a, uh, a mix-up with drinks, we didn't have any, so this is Eunice, who is one of the event organizers, and Simon, and we went round the corner, and uh, they, 
we raided, raided Sainsbury's together for 200 people's worth of drinks. So thank you so much for, for the help. Also, Ludo in the back, who does AV and all the event staff who do the drinks and everything. Thank you so much. Okay, Simon has uh, a thing to say. Okay, so um, please bear with me. I'm a software developer and this is a first time, but um, safety announcement. In the case of fire, there will be an automated uh, signal, which is spoken words and instructions. Please familiarise yourself with the exits. They are here and there. Um, don't use the lifts. Use common sense. Um, main exits are that way. There's stairs that go up and take you out. Look for the green signs. Uh, and, well, as always, on behalf of Sainsbury's, fantastic to see so many of you here. Um, you know, pleasure to host these events and give something back. And we're hiring. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So thank you very much. With that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. So please, a round of applause for Byron. Thanks, Sarah. Can you all hear me? All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the cheesy analogy of MLflow and kubeflow. Uh, my name is Byron Allen. I'm a senior consultant at a company called Servian. Servian is a consultancy. We're based in Australia, so we're relatively new to this market. No, this is not an Australian accent. I'm, I grew up in the US, uh, but I lived in Australia for a couple of years, worked for Serbian, and I've come over here as um, part of the first team in London. And so, great, uh, you know I'm a consultant, but what does that really mean? What do I actually do? We're a data analytics company, so uh, I'm a data scientist. I kind of do some stuff related to data science. Am I a data engineer? So, yeah, I do add data engineering kind of stuff. Uh, cloud engineer, one of those terms. Well, yeah, sure, maybe. Um, ML engineer, this one's new. Come out, I feel like this is a new term in the last couple years. Um, it's probably the one that maybe suits me the best, so I'll go with that. I certainly do a lot of stuff related to ML, and whether that's exploration or uh, going all the way to deploying ML models into production. Um, so that's the client side. I do engagements that revolve around those kinds of projects. I also uh, helped Servian to acquire our ML specialization uh, for Google Cloud. I do uh, several hackathons. One in particular that's really interesting if you like sports analytics is this NRL Data Jam. It's based in Sydney. If, you're ever, if you ever happen to be in Australia, I really encourage you to check it out. Um, and I write on Medium as well uh, about um, ML as much as I can. And so um, one of the topics that I think is most interesting is uh, ML ops, and in particular, there are quite a number of tools out there that are starting to come on uh, into the market. But I think, like any domain, like if you look at Martech, for example, there's a lot of tools. There's tool proliferation, but what do all of them do? They kind of all look a little same, same, in some ways. So, uh, you know, what is useful for your company, for your organization, for you as a as a practitioner? Um, so this is by no means an exhaustive list of the ML ops ecosystem, but I think to me these are some uh, really interesting tools, um, and it kind of shows a little bit of the diversity. You see enterprise tools, you do see open source tools, and you, um, of course, see some cloud vendors in there as well. I'll focus more on the open source tools, and in particular, <coughs> I'll focus on uh, MLflow and Kubeflow. And, and if you look at those two, um, and I, I will mention Selden, and I have that on the list for a reason, it, it too is an open source uh, tool, Selden Cores. Um, but MLflow and Kubeflow, they seem to be quite popular. They've gained a lot of notoriety. And just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of either of those uh, before tonight? Just a quick show of hands. OK, a lot of you. And how many of you actually do ML in your day-to-day -day work as well? Okay. <laughs> Some of your team do. Some of your team do. OK, excellent. All right. Well, um, you know, it does always seem like this is, the last year it does seem like we're still in the early days of this, uh, talking about these kinds of tools. And I guess that's why I'm excited about it. It is, it is early days, and these tools are really powerful, and I've gotten to use some of them. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. So MLflow and Kubeflow, um, those are the ones I'll focus on. 
Uh, MLflow, just as a really quick overview, it does uh, tr tracking of models. So that's not just the model itself, as in uh, the, f the file that executes uh, the algorithm, but also uh, the, the metrics, the parameters, and any kind of artifacts that are associated with that model, which is inherently important for the development of ML models. It's kind of uh, analogous to uh, version control with code. Um, there's also MLflow projects and MLflow models. I won't focus on those as much because I feel like MLflow tracking is really central to kind of understanding uh, how MLflow works and where it really shines. Kubeflow, I think especially if uh, you've dealt a lot with Kubernetes, this will be really familiar or it might be sort of familiar to you. Um, it obviously is a uh, system that runs on Kubernetes, requires Kubernetes to run, and it is a collection of a lot of different projects that run on Kubernetes. And it helps you kind of run the entire pipeline end to end. So uh, the classic analogy of Cheddar Tees and Cacio e Pepe, this is how I view uh, MLflow and Kubeflow, for better or worse. I don't know if, that's, if you get that, but uh, where I'm coming from with that is, if you don't know what Cacio e Pepe is, First off, it's a sophisticated version of mac and cheese. And like any good mac and cheese, it's a lot of cheese. It's mostly cheese. And it's specifically Parmesan and Pecorino, Romano, kind of coming together. Um, it's obviously a lot more. There's more to it than just that. But to me, that's kind of how I see, see these two tools. It's cheddar cheese and cacio e pepe. And so that's kind of just sets up just the baseline analogy and baseline understanding of how they might work. But how do they really, you know, how do these two tools work? Where do they sit in your workflow? And I do think it is important to back up and ask the question, OK, what, what environment uh, do these two tools inhabit? And for me, the way of uh, digesting that and explaining it to, to clients and colleagues was to kind of create this little value chain, which I call the production ML value chain. And like any value chain, there is a uh, supporting group of activities. Uh, in this case, it's you know foundational data analytics activities like master data management, data lakes, data integration hub, DevOps, monitoring, support, governance. All of these kind of come together to help support your primary activities, which in this case seek to develop an environment where you can perform experimentation. So that is everything from exploratory data analysis to ML model design, all the way through to production, where you deploy a model. Um, and then that brings us to you know, the primary activities themselves. So what, 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 is, uh, what are the primary activities for uh, this production ML value chain? I see them as collaboration, which is uh, largely related to tools and how you collaborate. There are a lot of different platforms that allow you to uh, perform that um, in different ways. You also have ML uh, design. Uh, when you're talking about model design, it's more of a framework. And to me, these two kind of work hand in hand. And how you do this with Kubeflow versus how you do this with MLflow, it changes the dynamic. And it might be one tool might be better for your team or for your organization. Uh, Data pipeline management, obviously, when you're working towards deploying uh, something in production, you will need to split things into training data. You'll need to split them into valuation data. You'll need to split it into online data, or the data that you're currently scoring or inferring upon and making some prediction. And then that moves us into model management. OK, you have all this data. You have a data pipeline. But how does, uh, how does all that data, as it changes over time, how does it impact your model? You might have many models that you develop through the year um, that will change. And as your data changes, it can uh, impact the quality of your model. And so you'll need to manage those models kind of in a similar way you would manage code in a CI CD framework in the way that you might have things that you're experimenting with, things that, you are, uh, that you've pushed into UAT or uh, things you've pushed into production. So model management is really key to ensuring um, that you have a working uh, production ML system. And then that obviously leaves hosting, which is where you actually host uh, the model itself. Like, there's some organizations, some teams that will just, you know, they'll ha have something running on a laptop in a closet, 
and you know that <laughs> that might suit their needs. But if you're trying to scale up, you might want to start looking at other advanced tools. And so obviously this is all in the name of trying to enable experiments and uh, maximize ROI, develop models that you can trust, uh, de develop models that are maintainable, usable, and maybe usable across divisions. And so I kind of will take you through each um, primary activity in the value chain and kind of how I see MLflow and Kubeflow within this space. So for me, MLflow, and I'll just tag each slide with the, the correct, the appropriate tool. Um, MLflow, it, it's really quite powerful. It's very simple and sweet. It's, it's quite elegant, actually. Um, it's versatile, and it effectively works like logging, and it is a kind of logging. Um, so you can simply log your models, log your metrics, parameters, and artifacts, um, and that can either be stored locally on a file system or remotely into some sort of blob storage or S3 bucket. And you can, through a simple uh, pip install, get this Python library and set up your UI um, on a remote server or locally, and you can see all the results. Now, if you go back up, you can see here parameters, metrics, and this can be kind of exhaustive. It can be as much as you want. It's like logging. There's also the project format, which allows you to rerun models through a YAML file. So you can import all of your dependencies. And if you wanted to share with a colleague and allow them to rerun the same model, but with different parameters and experiment with that, you can do that in this project format. So I find that MLflow is a really valuable tool for collaboration, um, as well as ML model design. And so, for example, uh, at one client site, over the course of the engagement, we tracked our uh, performance over time and the score that we're getting for a specific model as we developed it. And you can see there's kind of a gradual shift upwards as we improved over time. And you saw it really go up there for a second, then it kind of went back down. Well, MLflow helped us debug an issue that we had in that instance. And so it was really invaluable in model design. <coughs> Kubeflow, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Kubeflow has a package called Metadata, which uh, essentially achieves a very similar end. I did find it not as, um, not quite as elegant as MLflow in the way that, uh, it, in the way it kind of ended up getting used because we were running locally in our environment on our laptops and we needed to kind of share because we're all working remotely as a team. Um, and you couldn't really do this as effectively on Kubeflow. There is a package to run locally, but we're having trouble um, actually doing the logging function to do that. However, uh, Kubeflow does offer notebooks on Kubernetes, so you could actually run notebooks within that Kubernetes environment, which I find probably really valuable for a larger team than, say, what we were working with, which was like a five-person team. If you scaled up, I think this could be really valuable. It's a hosted notebook system. So in that sense, I think the, the teams that uh, would maybe be using Kubeflow do need a little bit more skills and capability with Kubernetes, and they need uh, more of a like, support from DevOps, for example. Um, and that's where Kubeflow kind of uh, comes into its own when it's being used in anger to deploy ML models. So the next step in that primary activities is data pipeline management. I left this slide blank intentionally because I don't really feel like MLflow shines in this area. So Databricks has uh, um, Delta Lakes, which offered th that kind of a, a capability, but really that's not exactly open source. So I kind of left that out. Um, however, I do think Kubeflow really has something quite special in this arena, especially when you're looking at orchestration and scheduling, which you can do directly in Kubeflow, which as a small data science team or even in a larger data science team, this is really valuable. Um, it also has a, a tool called Feast, which allows you to do feature engineering uh, and decouple that from your data warehouse, which is quite special. And just to, out of curiosity, have, how many of you understand the concept of feature engineering within ML? Okay, so feature engineering is the idea that you take a feature and you turn it into something that a machine uh, learning algorithm can read. So let's say you have text data 
something that's very binary, um, like true, false. They're in London or they're not in London. That turns into one and zero, whereas like if it's a small list of locations, maybe it becomes you know, one to seven, the top uh, you know, seven cities within the UK, something like that. Um, and obviously, you can go further and further with that. You can derive you know, uh, standard deviation, max, minimum. Um, there's other tools to create things that are uh, more advanced than that. But in its simplest form, that's feature engineering. <clears throat> but you don't have to store all those features, which is really the important part. Uh, you don't have to store them in a warehouse. You could just develop them because they are derivative of the features you already have in your warehouse. So that's where Feast comes into play. And I think this is really powerful and quite special. Um, when it comes to model management, this is where MLflow, I think, really kind of, it, it, again, it does really well. As I mentioned before, it kind of has this governability through its UI. Uh, you're able to uh, create graphs and understand how your models are performing as uh, you design them and as you put them into production, you're able to store artifacts that help make them more explainable. This is obviously a very simple graph. It's just a confusion matrix. It's kind of like uh, one of the very uh, early graphs that you, anybody would use uh, to help diagnose the performance of a model, but obviously it can get a lot more complicated than that. You could also store your data that you use to train that model, and you could use that to help version control your model, in a sense. Um, but I think the thing that's really nice about MLflow is it offers this model registry, which allows you to keep track of what models actually are in experimentation, what's in staging, production, and what's maybe put to the side. Um, and this really helps kind of fulfill this idea of, well, OK, in code, like when you're just developing as a coder, uh, you might have this CI-CD framework that you work to, but what is the equivalent when you're developing ML models? Yes, you have code, but you also have all these other dependencies, and I think this really helps achieve that, that paradigm. Model management in Kubeflow, I don't see quite the same thing, but I do see another thing within Kubeflow that I like a lot, which is a tool called Katib, which helps you do hyperparameter tuning. And just out of curiosity, how many of you know what hyperparameter tuning is? All right, so. Um, the idea is when you train models, you will have multiple inputs and multiple parameters in order to uh, run the model, but you can adjust those parameters to get a better outcome. But the thing is, the number of permutations of those parameters can really grow a lot, and so how do you find the ideal model very quickly through all these different parameters? That's where hyperparameter tuning comes into play. And in its most brute force version, it just kind of iterates through all of these permutations of the model in order to find the best model. However, there are some more advanced options that use Bayesian optimization in order to uh, tailor or help search and find the ideal model based on a specific metric. And Katib would do something like that. Um, so that's quite useful. When it comes to hosting, uh, MLflow allows you to host on you know, cl uh, two cloud vendors, Azure and AWS. It also uh, is capable of hosting in Spark, so any kind of Spark cluster. Um, and also there's a, a, a tool called Selden Core, which allows you to host on containers, which is really quite uh, uh, obviously very interesting. Um, you, all, you can sit it behind a REST API and just run it locally if you wanted to. And there is kind of an experimental um, Docker container that's uh, in the works, but this also kind of like, I think Selden uh, kind of takes on that, that little niche. Selden also is kind of found in a lot of different places within Kubeflow. Um, six, or sorry, three of the six options that you see uh, for serving or for hosting a model within Kubeflow are in some way related to Selden. Two are direct, they are, one is Selden serving, serving, the other one supports, is supported by Selden, and then this other one, KF serving, uh, had a lot of input from the people at Selden to develop that tool itself. So in my experience and kind of going through analyzing these two tools and kind of figuring out how they work and where they fit, I developed a, a sense of, of um, how it all kind of fits together. And I always tried to communicate with this slide, which I felt it always seemed a little confusing, uh, especially when I talk to people. So I tried to distill it down into something a bit more simple and a bit more approachable, not to mention, I think, reusable, which is really quite valuable. And for me, this really highlights 
um, where these uh, where these tools fit as well. So I'm not suggesting that this be Google Cloud. This slide just happened to be a Google Cloud slide. Um, it could be AWS. It could be Azure. It could be on-prem. But the point is, MLflow kind of sits in this interesting space where it's helping you manage dependencies for the model in the same way that Git or something like Jenkins or CI CD tool would manage dependencies and versioning for uh, your code development. And so having these together, I think, is really what is necessary for a production ML system uh, at its core. And ML flow just sits in a very sweet spot. Uh, and in this kind of simple pattern, you could easily uh, swap in Kubeflow uh, instead of, say, some other kind of uh, machine learning training tool. You could swap in Selden for hosting or uh, some other serving tool. So for me, I work to this simple pattern. Um, Kubeflow is really interesting. It is still early days, but I think they offer, they're offer they going to offer something very special. It does kind of have a broader scope, um, and I'll, I'm excited to see how that actually pans out in the future. So cheddar cheese or cacio e pepe? I don't know what you want, but both sound really great to me. Um, I guess it's just about what you're in the mood for and what's right for you. So cheddar cheese, really versatile, kind of good on everything. Um, that to me, that's kind of ML flow, but Cacho e Pepe is something quite special, and I think um, it it will come into its own in the future. Um, so if you want to hear more from me, uh, I'm on Medium, um, or you can email me or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Any questions for Byron? Uh, can you oops, can you speak to like the scale of models that you've been you uh, been using with these workflows? Uh, scale in like terms of the size of the data, or scale as in terms of how many times it's run? Either and both. Like either and both. Uh, yeah. So like the size of the data, like that we would train on, like terabytes worth of data. Um, in terms of scale, a lot of it is enterprise level. So it's not necessarily run in the same way that um, it would if it was like a customer-facing model where it gets hit a lot, which I think especially that's where containers becomes a really valuable tool. Is if you're kind of in a in a scenario where you're deploying a model that is customer-facing and it gets hit a lot, it can scale really well in containers. But in an enterprise, you might just be running it over a really large data set that's you know you're in just in our case it's like gigabytes every day. So you'd run it once in batches. Does that answer your question? Uh, kind of. So, so when you say uh, customer facing, would that be sort of interactive? So someone comes in and uh, wants some analysis and then? Yeah, so take, for example, if you had like a, a website, like take marketing, for example, and you wanted to personalize uh, content or an offer, and you wanted to make that really reactive, you might kind of have that sitting behind your website. And as you're seeing click-through behavior change in specific ways, you have the model respond immediately. And so that could, be, that could cause a lot of traffic, depending on the scale. Um, or you might actually have the scenario in the, kind of a similar marketing scenario where you're scoring that person as, oh, they're, they're likely to be of this uh, category. Therefore, we're going to serve them this kind of model the next time they come around. So it's a little bit more passive in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That so, so the first case is kind of similar to like you have basically data streaming in and you update sort of as, as fast as you can, uh, yeah. taking into account the newly streaming in data. Yeah, correct. You're wearing a Google Cloud t-shirt. So if, like, uh, if you had like Dataflow, for example, Dataflow, you could like host an ML model in Dataflow and have it uh, react to streaming data, for example. What would be what are your biggest challenges in terms of like getting the like getting your full process and actually getting it through from the code towards like say using in production? So let's say both in the integration phase and in like deployment. So in the initial phases, I I think it's kind of finding the right use case. I think a lot of people are still at the phase where they're kind of trying to figure out what, what is the right use case. They're interested in ML, they've heard about it, they want to use it, but what's the right use case? 
and trusting the model, figuring out how to explain it internally. Because uh, you can create very advanced models, but it's hard to explain them. So without explainability, it can be a tough sell internally. I think uh, systems like that track like MFlow and Kubeflow help that explainability and kind of make the whole process more accountable. Um, further on, I think when it comes to deployment, um, it's maybe just about uh, knowledge of what tools are available. I think a lot of this stuff is quite scalable now. And so like the hurdle that used to exist was how do you have these things scale? Um, you know, And I think a lot of the tools like uh, Kubeflow and Selden kind of address that, that, uh, that reality. And the second one, uh, uh, have you thought about like potentially leveraging serverless? Le uh, in what way? So let's say for, because you, you were mentioning containers and yeah. getting like, the training and everything executed as fast as possible. So from like, just a quick thinking point of view, getting like, a Lambda function executed would be the quickest way to get something. Yeah, and that's certainly possible depending on what your model does. So some models actually have a pre-processing bit ah. and they require more data. And so when you look at like Lambda functions or cloud functions, there can be limits to how much you can pass through. Mm -hmm. So depending on the specific use case, it, yeah, it could be possible. Yeah. Hi. Uh, what are your recommendations on this? Like, uh, what, do you have any general guidelines or like your do's and don'ts in this? Uh, for production, yeah. for, for what yeah. specifically? Yeah, for, for this data modeling, any, any guidelines or recommendations? Any guidelines or recommendations? Yeah. I, I guess I could have like, uh, that could be a lot of different things. Um, I mean, for me, I, I work to the value chain a lot, and that's, to me, it helps to logically separate it out and have those conversations regarding each stage. Uh, with teams internally and kind of understanding what tools fit in that stage and the dependencies uh, that each stage has on the next. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I guess it's very broad. It's a very broad question, so I'm uh, not, like, do you have something like, more specific? Uh, like for this particular, you must have certain guidelines or okay, these are the patterns or this, uh, this, this is the way to go. Yeah. You know, so I'm I'm looking for that kind of uh, that that slide. That's what I work to. This one. Okay. Okay. But yeah. did you face any challenges in this model or some, like in this pattern? In this pattern? Yeah. So in this pattern, the hardest that I've found is maybe more the A/B testing bit. And there's tools such as Selden, which I've found to be very helpful within that space. Um, you can also, you know, there's other tools to do A/B testing. Uh, that could be helpful. Uh, that, for me, at least personally, was uh, probably the most challenging. I think in terms of time, like a actual time that you put into this, it, it always seems to go back to data pipeline and managing your data and Great. making sure that it's in the right f format and that it's accounted for. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, coming down. Yeah, hi. Um, so you mentioned those two uh, different projects have different use cases. One is for more smaller teams, and the other one is for, well, potentially more scalable. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering how much can you reuse to move from the ML flow into uh, Kip flow? Because if you are potentially you start like experimenting with your small data team, and eventually, well, happens, it grows, yeah. it grows. I see what you mean. Yeah, so take, for example, this slide where it had like ML, ML flow. I do think this pattern is like a good early starter for ex, uh, experimenting with putting together a, develop, a production ML system. And ML flow can kind of scale with you as you go along. But um, it still doesn't address a lot of kind of other foundational issues, such as like uh, feature engineering, hyperparameter tuning, which for example, in Kubeflow, it offers that. 
and um, you know that's you that requires a large amount of compute to actually perform that. So this it offers like one so, like one part of the equation. Um, but when you start to really scale up as a team, if you're going to use ML in anger and you're going to start deploying stuff, especially if it's any kind of model that it, in any form or way kind of impacts the, the health or wealth of, or well-being of someone, you know, you want to have some accountability for it. And it needs to be, you need to retrain because data just changes. It's like how we learn as well. As human beings, our environment changes over time and we sometimes have to adjust our knowledge and understanding of that. Same thing with models. You have to retrain. And um, I think if you do that, if you have a lot of models, which there's a, there's a client uh, example that I have where it's thousands of models uh, that they, they operate. And it's within the marketing context. And they use it to personalize their, their marketing content. Um, and so if they want to keep it relevant, they have to retrain a lot. And I think it's just more stable to do that in something like Kubeflow, although you could uh, arguably do that separately in another system. But Kubeflow kind of nicely brings everything together in one space. I think that's kind of the value of Kubeflow. Cool. Um, and out of curiosity, because on the, one of the earliest um, slides you have, um, you have Argo on the slide? Sorry. Argo. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have, have you experimented with Argo? Have you tested, tried? Uh, Not really. <laughs> Uh, you're referencing oh, the very earlier this one. Last one. Yeah, Argo specifically, no. Sorry. I haven't had much. It was yeah. just out of curiosity. Just. Yeah. Perhaps one more question? Yeah. So I have not been using those, but I'm curious. Uh, you showed that the models were getting better and better. Uh, is there some manual step or requirements from data scientists for overfitting or? Uh, so requirements to avoid to not, overfitting? Yes. Uh, yeah, it depends on the model. Um, so, and you have to use these kind of techniques to evaluate that model and make sure that you're not overfitting. Um, so, so is it, I'm trying to get, is it manual or this? Mm, okay, is there an automated way to say, did you yeah. overfit? You could kind of build it in. There's not like a tool specifically that does that well, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, but yeah, you could build it. Can I see someone else? Or? Uh, yeah, go on. Sorry. Thank you. I'm, I'm not from data scientist background, anything, but around 10 years ago, maybe slightly less, I had been working for a company, HPC. We were processing um, the underneath the sea, how much oil it is, etc. Actually, the data was so huge, they could only bring us in tapes. If I give you a sample, when there was an issue with UK and Falkland Islands, Argentina, etc., that data came to us, we processed this. I think it was the fourth, big, fourth biggest um, the processing company in the world. We had, uh, I think, 5,000 nodes in US, 3,500 nodes in UK. This big giant and um, the multiple Xeon um, the CPUs, memories, etc. And they were 24 by 7. Even in the Christmas, they never ever sleep. These things. When we were processing these things, what we find, the limitations, I mean, my, my job was that they wanted us to see how can we do different ways, etc. And one of the things, the prohibitive, for example, amount of data. How to process them and time CPU. The amount of what? Sorry, I couldn't. I'm yeah. having so trouble apologies. Here, yeah. Amount of data, how okay. to process that was say prohibitive. We tried to check if we could do via AWS, Amazon. Once we upload it, what I'm trying to ask, just quick summary. I see the ML and your systems, the way it's designed for more niche rather than what we used to do more crude. Basically, what we used to generate, 3D cube, you could slice it vertically or horizontally. And the, and the scientists, they look at it, they could see from velocity maps if there's an oil. Now, I think there's a different use case. With your one, it's more um, concentrated on more complicated data and dynamically changing. With our one, I think more static data, but far more bigger volume. I was wondering, is it, could it be used in HPC type of 
I mean, what would be the limits or limitations if we're trying to put our food on the, say, gas? How much these things can handle? That's what I'm asking. Right. I mean, your point is that you felt, felt like the data you're dealing with is very static. Is that correct? More or less, yes. It comes yeah. in the tapes. It's the big ship goes with the tentacles. Then I see what's underneath the sea. It's a massive big data, but then that's it. Once it arrives to static, it never changes. Yeah, I think there are certain uh, circumstances where uh, you would have to retrain less. Um, I'm hesitant just to say there's a, any there's use cases where you would never have to retrain just because data inherently does shift or things can happen. Um, so yeah, you don't always have to retrain in this in this scenario. The ideal scenario is is a scenario where you ultimately do need to retrain your models yeah. because the underlying data does shift. Uh, at least some or enough to where it could be damaging. I think j just for, again, everyone's thing, that's my last thing. Then um, what they did, they actually purchased another company. They had a different uh, model, the window model. Rather than going through all the data because it was massive, it was going through the samples of it. And if the sample is successful, then they were processing that columns, etc. Otherwise, it was just impossible. These things were huge. Then, um, Anyway, that's why I thought something quite nice we explain. I appreciate it. Then I was thinking if I could correlate it one day, maybe. Thank you. I appreciate it again. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please, for Bye One. Thank you. So next up, we have Inez, who's going to talk, talk to us about disaster recovery in the cloud. Um, um, I'm also quite pleased because having shown that Kubernetes Days London uh, website, seven people have already signed up on the form that was on that site to say they were interested in attending. So I'm really happy about that. Cool. I yeah. think we are ready to go, so please, a round of applause to welcome Inet. Oh. Who also has come today from Paris and is going back tonight, so she's here just for this. So I'm very oh. grateful to her. Hello, okay. Um, hi, my name is Ines Shikhrohu. It's a bit weird, I'm actually Tunisian, from Tunisia but I work in Paris. Uh, so I'm a cloud and DevOps consultant in a um, consultant company in Paris called uh, Agila. And I'm here today to talk about my journey uh, doing disaster recovery in the cloud. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, Amazon Web Services, but I mean, the phases that I've been through, um, they are practically the same for all of the other cloud providers. Um, so before we, we had the thought to do disaster recovery, um, we actually we had a huge old legacy system. And uh, so one of the first things that we thought about is uh, separating this legacy system to microservices. So uh, small uh, microservices, uh, dockerizing them, and so with that came um, a change of the, the, the project teams itself. So now we have independent teams. And so with that also separate CI CDs, separate languages for the different microservices. And so this was a very um, first step that was very important because it helped us later on uh, to move, for example, to orchestration in, like with Docker. So in our case, we used um, ECS, a managed system of Amazon, but also we had the thought of using Kubernetes, but then, you know, management. So, um, <laughs> so um, the process was uh, we had all of the microservices in Git GitLab, and we used the CI CD using GitLab CI. And, uh, uh, all of our infrastructure uh, code was written uh, in Terraform. 
and so Terraform and Ansible for um, configuration management, and then uh, we uh, we wrote all of our pipelines with GitLab CI, and so for microservices, uh, they were built into Docker and then pushed into ECR, the Docker registry. And so it was fully automated, the deployment and everything. And so then we decided to go to Fargate, which is also um, orchestration for Docker, but this time you don't need to manage your uh, instances. And then even for our old uh, batches that were used to be like some script shells and you run them on the instances. So now we moved everything to serverless um, using CloudWatch for uh, Amazon CloudWatch uh, events for um, like as a cron job and then uh, lambdas to run the scripts. I mean the jobs that were used to be scripts. And so for our backend services also, we use API gateways, CloudFront, CDN, uh, Route 53 instead of the old uh, DNS servers that we used to uh, do to have on-premises. So now everything that was on-premises and legacy, uh, we moved to cloud. And so we moved to serverless and dockers and everything, which made it easier for us to have the decision to do disaster recovery. And the main thing also that we thought about, so before we had all of our uh, databases that used to be run on uh, servers, and we had to manage the servers, and now we moved, uh, we moved to managed databases, and so now it's easy to administer, it's scalable, um, available, everything that gave us the opportunity to do uh, an easy D DR that lasted, um, I would say for the first days, it lasted just one week. Um, if we tried to do this before, we wouldn't have to because even, even the fact that we had everything on premises, the, manage, the management had a problem with the costs and doing um, a DR in the, in the on premises servers that was a bit scary for them. So now with the cloud, Everything is on demand, and it's pay as you go, so it made it easier for us to convince uh, the management to do the test. Also, um, the important thing to think about is the observability. So uh, we made sure that we had the metrics, uh, logs, and traces. And so for the metrics, we used Prometheus uh, as a time series database. Uh, to collect and process uh, the metrics. And so we use a lot of exporters actually, but these are the main ones that we use to uh, make sure that later on doing the DR test, we, we had a way to uh, say if the system is up and running, is it functional or not. Uh, the logs, we use CloudWatch logs, and then we push everything to Splunk but we're thinking about move, moving to ELK. And for the traces, we use X-Ray, which is managed services uh, from AWS. And so disaster recovery is an important thing to think about. Disaster can happen in any way. Uh, it can be human, it can be hardware, it can be natural. And we even faced this before uh, with our legacy system. And that was like um, the main part that um, where we started to think that we really need to uh, think about this. So uh, for disaster recovery, a lot of people would do such a cycle, so plan. And uh, I'm going to talk about the phases that we've been through to achieve the disaster recovery. So, uh, starting by the preparation phase. So, first of all, as I said, the management support. You need to find a way to convince them. This is, I would say, the most, the hardest thing to go through. Um, if that's done, then you have the planning team. 
Uh, so it's a group of people that were responsible for this uh, kind of job. They were the ones that sent the communication, they are the ones that uh, wrote the plan and everything. Uh, collecting data, so we, in, so the company where I work on, it's an insurance company, and so we had a lot of projects, and it was hard for us to communicate between projects, so it was a main step because at that step, we knew all of the connections that, hap that happens between the projects. And so we, uh, we drew like a huge um, picture where we had all of the projects, the calls between them, all of the connections, and which made us easier after that to evaluate the operations. What's more critical to start with? So you just can't stop, uh, you, you can't start a disaster recovery like um, with everything, with like uh, doing the, doing recovery to everything that you have on the company. So the first disaster uh, test would be just the critical points, the critical uh, projects that management uh, would be also happy uh, to to see as a result. And then uh, step five is identifying and evaluating risks. So what are the threats that really can happen um, if, this ha if, for example, this component stopped working? And like, uh, this may like, give us a, a clearer picture of where to start. So uh, after that, determining recovering strategies, I'm going to be talking about recovery strategies. And so we studied different types. And uh, after that, after getting like an answer, documenting the writing plan, communicating the plan between all of the projects, testing the plan, and the most important is evaluating and always updating the plan. So two main things that um, are keys here uh, in every DR test, they are the RPO and RTO. And so the RTO is the point in time where the files and databases are restored. The RTO is the time it takes to restore the service. So for example, we'd say the RPO after a disaster recovery test, I now have the data of 24 hours uh, earlier. And the RTO is I was able to get the system up and running in two hours. So uh, the first strategy is the backup and restore. It's just uh, you backup your data and that's it. And after that, uh, in the actual disaster uh, recovery test, you create all of your resources, you do the DNS cutover, the monitoring stack, CICD, everything. So here it, it has the worst RTO and RPO, but it's very, um, it's, it's nothing, it's just the, the cost of storing backups in AWS, for example. In the pilot light uh, strategy, here you're doing the database replication. So you're actually paying for another database in the DR region. And so then uh, you just scale your database. If you, for example, if you're going to do a database with the minimum of resources, minimum instance type, so then you scale up your database, you promote it to be a primary database, and then the rest of the tasks. Here, uh, the RTO and RPO are going to be better because here you're not wasting time to copy the database in the DR region. Finally, the warm standby. This, uh, we can say that it's kind of like fault tolerant architecture where you're, you'll be having the same uh, infrastructure in the DR region. And so here uh, you have uh, your two-way database replication, for example. Uh, you have your resources actually, but with the minimum uh, type. Uh, you have your stack of monitoring, your CICD, everything. And then in disaster recovery test, you just scale horizontally your instance. Your, your, for example, if it's an ECS cluster, Let's say 
it, it had one task, but now it will be like, for example, three tasks running. And for the database, uh, scale, scaling up, so vertically, uh, with a bigger instance type. So here, yeah, the RTO and FPO will be two minutes, up to minutes, but it will be um, most ex more expensive and it's more complex to manage because you have literally two infrastructures in parallel. So speaking about the warm uh, standby, we chose to do it for uh, some of our pr critical projects, I would say. So for us, it was um, just the business critical components, which, was, which are the components that had sensitive data. Uh, and uh, w or the core components where all of the other components depend on. For example, we had a project that was responsible of the authentication. And so uh, it was, for us, it was a critical uh, business project. And so everything was already prepared in the origin. So the VPC, the subnets, uh, the instances, uh, ECM certifications, um, some old passwords. Uh, S3 artifacts, the KMS key for encryption. And so, uh, for example, we chose to do Nexus, uh, the GitLab, and the monitoring stack, and the project of the authentication as a test. And it was done in a matter of, uh, I would say for the first test, it took us just two days maybe, because we had everything as an infrastructure as code, and we had the replicated data, so everything was easily made uh, and um, it worked pretty fine. So now uh, moving to um, the recovery phase for the, for the databases. So the main key was the database. And here um, there are a lot of strategies to do your recovery or choose your recovery style for the database. For example, for the business critical components, where you want your APO up to seconds, you can use the full, uh, full scale async uh, replication. So there are cross regions, um, data, uh, read replicas for databases. And so after that, in the DR test, you just promote your database as we've seen in the earlier slide. And then um, in, in AWS, for example, the, actually, it's, it, it supports uh, different master keys for encryption. So we made different KMS key for the DR region, just for security and protection. And here, it will be the most expensive, of course, because you'll be having your read replica running all the time. <coughs> the second thing is if you want to uh, spend less money, I would say, uh, but you'll be um, increasing the RTU and RPU. It's just to have a scaled down uh, read replica instead of uh, the actual uh, size of the uh, master database. Uh, then, uh, for example, for SQL Server, it was a particular case because here, um, so SQL Server does not support asynchronous replication. And so we use a thing called database migration service. And so this service, um, so it's not really made for like full running um, replication, but you can do migration with it. It's just like you have uh, more extra config to do. And so it uses the change data capture that SQL Server supports to do uh, the migration. And so uh, here, yeah, as we've seen, so uh, you'll be having two databases at the same time. You need to configure your source database, your target database, and then the server, the service will do the, the replication. Uh, for the less critical components, uh, so there is a service called AWS um, Backup. I'm going to talk about it just quickly. So it's centralized backup management offered by AWS. It offers a lot of other features like lifecycle management, um, a lot of things. And in two, 2020, um, they, they now support cross-region uh, backup. So the backup you do in your original region is automatically uh, copied into the DR region. 
However, this was not uh, supported when we did the DR. So in our case, we use a SNS topic that launches um, a, a copy snapshot uh, function, lambda function, that does the copy of the snapshot later on. And so, yeah. Uh, after that, in the DR test, you just create your resources using Terraform uh, from the latest snapshot you had. And finally, um, the, the not very critical components where you just minimize the... So here we had one hour of backup job that was running, but here, for example, we had 12 hours um, as a job ground job. So uh, what we did to reach a decision was to, uh, to build a decision tree for the DR uh, strategy. So this is just an example, but it was much uh, bigger than this. So for example, is it business critical? If it's yes, is cost important? For example, no. Is the service available for under 20 minutes tolerable? If it's yes, scale down, use scale down cross-region read replica. If it's no, full scale cross-region read replica. So these are the main keys that um, I would say uh, were the factors where we found the final answers for each project. Uh, also for EBS, which is the, ins uh, the, disk, ins uh, the disk of the instances, um, you snapshot AWS backup. For EFS, for example, there is a server called uh, DataSync, which is fully managed. It copies the, from EFS to EFS, or you can use S3 to, have, uh, to spend less money. And so for, for DynamoDB also, uh, there, are, there is a thing called global table, which is like two-way replication across multiple regions. However, this is very expensive but you have no downtime. Uh, in our case, we didn't use that. Uh, we use um, we use the, uh, uh, um, the DynamoDB backup, but with two lambdas. So a lambda to capture the data changes events and perform incremental backup to S3, and then another lambda to restore uh, the, the data that it had. So here the RTO actually depends on the number of the items uh, to insert. And yeah, it, it didn't cost um, like the one before. And for security, uh, we made sure to use a different KMS for encryption, uh, CloudTrail for, to monitor the, all of the events in your VPC, AWS Config, um, and a lot of other services. So eventually the application phase, it happened in a matter of few hours, just uh, clicking on the button in GitLab CI that launches your pipeline, your Terraform uh, deploys all of the other resources. And for the test phase, of course, we asked uh, our testers to do the functional automated test. And the cleanup is destroying and always updating the process. So yeah. This is this was my journey. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for such a great speech. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. At least four. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned that you have migrated your monolith architecture to microservices, mainly running on Docker. Yeah. It was ECS, as I understood. Uh, when you refer to backups of the EBS volumes, what components you actually did run on your e like EC2? Because I assume that the whole solution was like container-based. So what exactly was backed up as a part of the EBS snapshots? Yeah, so the thing is, we always had a part of legacy running in parallel of the the Docker orchestration. Okay, okay, makes yeah. sense. So uh, it was just for one server where we had to back up the ABS. Okay, cool. Uh, the other question I have, uh, you mentioned on your slides that uh, SQL Server does not support asynchronous replication. I was quite confused to learn this. Did you mention, did you meant like AWS RDS or which part of SQL Server does not support 
unsynchronous yeah, replication. Yeah, RDS where the engine is SQL Server. Ah, okay, so it's RDS limitation. Yeah. Okay, and the last question I have: um, when it comes to do, you know, like a, on your like a guideline with all the steps, you have like a failover testing or DR testing. How often do you? actually execute your DR drills to validate that all the changes in your application actually compliant with your DR strategy? Like, do you do it like on monthly basis, on like once a year, or what is your recommendation as person who actually went through the journey? How often you actually uh, want to do this with your production application? So yeah, um, yeah, so it, it concerned the production, as I said, and um, it, it was at the first time, um, we let it um, count down for one month. Mm -hmm. But then each two weeks, we had tests if there is change. If nothing is changed, then we okay. really d didn't do another test. But yeah, for the first time, it was just one month till we, uh, till we, so we grouped together all of the um, the conclusions that we had in each project. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much. I have two questions for you, essentially, and I did notice your migration path to, from of databases, on-premise databases to the cloud, AWS, you did highlight you moved an Oracle cluster. Am I to assume that the Oracle, in the Oracle database you, you moved over were not sitting on Spark machines? Bare metal Spark machines are in a clustered environment. How, did, how was that possible to move it over to the cloud, over to AWS? The second question I have is about behavioral analytics tools. You move, did you move from, did I hear you correctly say you move from Splunk to Elk, Elastic, or vice versa? One is quite expensive, but easy to use, and the only people who benefit from it are the shareholders who are the banks. Anyway, it was Splunk, it's expensive. Did I hear you correctly say you move from Splunk to Elk? Yeah, so before, uh, we just used CloudWatch uh, logs, and so all of the CloudWatch logs are pushed to Splunk, um, so after that, it cost. It's kind of expensive. After that, it became expensive to use Splunk, so we decided to change to the ELK uh, stack. Now, what about the Oracle databases, the Oracle clusters? I, I, I will assume Oracle shines. Oracle is larger than life as a, as a relational database. Now, in most cases, they're hosted on risk-based platforms like Spark. How did you? How was? How possible was it for you to move Oracle onto the cloud? AWS, as far as I know, do, does not support bare metals. Yeah. Risk-based bare metals. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So we didn't use anything that was offered by AWS or anything else. It was like seriously uh, from scratch migration to the cloud. In our case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you cover any scenario where you lose access to your AWS account, so you start from scratch? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, did you did you cover any scenario where you lose access to your AWS account, so you start from scratch and you have to build up everything? No, not yet. <laughs> but we. Uh, so one of the things that made management very scared and they decided to do another region was that w once the region where we had all of the infrastructure stopped working. And so everybody freaked out and yeah. Cool thing. It's very interesting if you tried. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, you did mention that uh, you were using Fargate as in for your services, right? So that's like a serverless uh, from the AWS. So what were the key features or the parameters that helped you to convince the management to go for the serverless architecture rather than the your own hosted Kubernetes or anything else? 
and what <coughs> role pricing played in that? Yeah, so um, I would say the management decided on just using uh, Amazon. So, uh, we, yeah, there was a study, there was a POC about Kubernetes, but then they, they were just too scared to switch. So we decided, okay, from ECS we can go a bit by bit to Fargate, and then I think eventually they would go to uh, EKS on Fargate. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, insurance companies, being just too scared to try new things. Did pricing play any role? Because uh, when it comes to serverless, people think, OK, because I don't need to pay for what I don't use. That's like uh, serverless, right? Yeah. And yeah, sorry, I, I might have gone wrong. So, <laughs> so like when you compare the EKS, the conventional EKS, and then the serverless EKS Fargate, what was the pricing difference did you find? Like, was it like x by 2 or x by 3, that kind of stuff? And, uh, I'm not sure about the pricing differences. OK. Yeah, it's all right. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I was wondering what you thought the biggest pain point on AWS was and what AWS could improve most to make uh, disaster recovery easier to implement. Microsoft <laughs> <laughs> if, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, there are things that weren't supported by specific engines of uh, databases. So, yeah, it was mainly the, the, most import the most difficult key, for example, to manage SQL Server. Uh, it was really fantastic, um, you know, uh, discussion about your story about the AWS. So my, my voice has gone just. Uh, so I have a, uh, two questions. One is, uh, do you use this only for a developer, or you implement the entire pipeline from the development to pre prod to the production environment, which is managed by the operation team? So what was that? Uh, your project is only the DevOps and uh, AWS. AWS is, is implemented for the development environment, or, or it's throughout the uh, entire uh, portfolio the productions. So we actually implemented this for prod only. All right. And uh, we had feature teams from each project, and they were grouped together to to do this uh, disaster recovery. So it was the operation team in each project and uh, just for prod. So what kind of uh, training uh, you, you have to go through the operation? Because most of the operations in the banking world or insurance world, they used to do all the uh, manual things, right? So uh, they don't be uh, quite comfortable with the scripting and automations, all the stuff. So what kind of challenges did you face when you go through this kind of automations to the operation teams to do that, you know? Did you face any kind of challenges to convince or change the culture of the way they used to do, or uh, you haven't seen any kind of challenges? Actually, so uh, all of the people that were concerned with this disaster recovery, their responsible daily job was actually uh, running, uh, writing pipelines, CICDs, uh, doing deployments. So they were already concerned with the, everything that's infrastructure. And so it was easily uh, for them to to start with such project. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, last question is that: What will happen if your AWS account is hacked? You know, so what? what, uh, what and somebody is completely removed your project, and next day you find you know something you got from the call from CIO, uh, everything down. So you will say no problem. I can do fix in two minutes, and then you log in and see the entire project's done. So what are the things you need to consider in that kind of critical digital recovery scenario? Uh, you will say the best practices so everybody can take that? Yeah. Uh, so the weird thing is, in this company, I, I will tell them, why did you choose Terraform? They'll be like, oh, because no, no vendor locking. And then I'll be like, yeah, but you're practically using every, every like managed service in AWS, which is weird. And so now they're, for example, in the company where I work on, now they're studying how to go back to other um, strategies where they can protect themselves if 
anything happens in Amazon. But yeah, one of the things is using Terraform instead of uh, cloud formation is that they don't you know, want to use vendor locking. And uh, the, the fact that they're studying Kubernetes use is because now they don't need uh, ECS or Fargate that's specific. So no Kubernetes, no vendor locking again. So yeah, I would say just thinking about other tools that can make you uh, do the same job, but uh, not really depending on the cloud provider. Thank you, thank you, Isi. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'd be more interested uh, to know like what kind of components, what set of AWS components we need to take backups. Like for example, we haven't covered about buckets. So do you rely on buckets? There won't be any problems with the data? Or else uh, how about like, for example, in the application code, for example, like Python or JavaScript. So do you expect to take any backups of those application code? And then like, uh, again, like databases, like AWS databases, do we still need to take backups of it? So I'd like to know like, what set of components you'd be more interested yeah. in case of disaster. Yeah. So um, for the first disaster test that they did, they really, so we really focused about database because it's the main key. However, um, so for the S3 buckets, for example, what we did is just uh, preparing them already in the DR region, so copying from region to region, which now we think we need to update to, uh, to do just uh, the copy when, uh, when doing the disaster uh, the disaster test uh, for the for the applications. So what we do is just preparing in the origin all of the um, Docker's that are, for example, uh, Terraform or Java GDK, just to build so that they can help building the application in the D origin. So what we do is preparing GitLab CI that has all of the applications, preparing just the main Docker images such as Terraform, Java, etc., and then rebuilding the versions and pushing them to, uh, to the DR region. So everything is made from scratch in the DR region. OK, thank you. Uh, sorry, one more question, uh, probably on top of the previous one. Uh, when it comes to you know, like S3 replication and database um, replication as well, it will be helpful in case of the region failure when you're just losing the primary region. But DI is also supposed to protect you from data corruptions. Let's say you have a ransomware or some malfunction in your code, which may result in your data in a three bucket or database just being corrupted. So it's still there. It's getting replicated, but it's not just the data you would want to see. So how did you approach data recovery in case of the data corruption? Yeah. Um, for now, we don't really have a specific uh, strategy to do that, but uh, it's an important thing that we've been thinking about. Uh, for the S3, um, so for now, since it's a global service, so we're, we're making sure we use the same one. Uh, but for databases, uh, yeah, we, we still didn't really think, did something about it, but it's one of the, yeah, it's in our priority plans, yeah. As I start, um, thank you. I mean, the, I would like to say all my colleagues as well, many companies, many organizations, they don't even have a good disaster recovery and the plan or anything. Then I'm considering that. It's a very good and the presentation, and, and I see it, it works. It may not be perfect, but if they are looking for a perfection, nothing perfect in the world, but it's a good starting point, and as you test it, it works. One thing I wanted to add, though, I work for, a, unfortunately, a some government organization in UK, and we wanted, to, yes, unfortunately, and it's a very bad one. Then um, the, we wanted to use Fargate on EKS, but what we realized just this week, it is only available some limited regions, and we are only allowed to use UK, London, and it's not available. You just realize it's only available in some limited regions. If you have uh, limitations like us, unfortunately, you can't use it. Um, yeah, it's, yes. it's yeah, one of those things, but we, we have to live with this, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, if you decide to use a cloud provider, you have to. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, quite soon. Hopefully, <laughs> they'll do it. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. For, uh, again. for us, we use uh, so the main region is Frankfurt. The second reason is Ireland. That's it, Ireland. And so Ireland. we made sure before starting anything that we had the same things on both regions. Thank you. I mean, it was a quite a good presentation. Again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question and then we're going to the break. Hi. Um, I'm interested in how do you measure the success or the failure of the disaster recovery and how do you learn lessons from the, these exercises? How we measure? Uh, so first of, first of all, we made sure that we had the monitoring stack uh, ready to see if the system is up and running. We, so we check everything as, um, as if any component have any problem, so we decide it's a failure. Um, so we, yeah, so we wanted to be strict as a, for ourselves as a first time. Uh, however, uh, it would be basically the testers that would say if everything works, works or not. And as uh, the test, technically uh, we would measure the RPO and RTO. This is why I said this is very important. And I would say the management again, they are the ones that took the decision on the RTO and RPO allowed to, to uh, do the test. Okay, round of applause, please, for Ine. <laughs> cool, we're now going to take a 10 minute break, so please be back here for 8.30. Thank you. Hi, come on in, come on in. I think there might be a few people left outside. Just a handful? Just a handful? Okay. So we can kick off. So our third speaker for the evening is Jai. So please welcome with a round of applause. Hey. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, do we have any SREs in here today? Yeah. Apart from Florian at the front. <laughs> Um, part of this talk, I hope to reach out to SREs or potentially software engineers that are thinking about site reliability engineering and are wondering, as an engineer or as a developer or someone from a, community, from a company, how do you actually work in SRE and what are the steps to kind of make that happen? So let's start the show. Um, quick introduction, so about me. Um, I work in SRE, DevOps, split between the two. Um, DevOps in terms of the platform side and then SRE in terms of the monitoring, building out all the instrumentation to make sure the monitors are up and that the services are reliable. Um, similar to CNCF, I run a meetup, London SRE. There'll be a slide at the end that has a link, so please if you're interested after the talk, I'd love it if you could join my group as well. Um, the last five years I've been working around Wintel and cloud engineering, mainly GCP. Um, large digital transformations, helping large organizations move their infrastructure into cloud and embrace SRE principles. Um, outside of that, I enjoy CNCF projects, K8s, and the whole ecosystem, specifically around um, service meshes and cloud security around K8s. Outside of that, I enjoy playing computer games and playing basketball. Um, very quick shout out to CNCF. Um, I was very fortunate last year in November to be a part of the D diversity scholarship. Um, for anybody in here that doesn't know, or if you're a key decision maker, um, it's a really powerful thing for the community, especially CNCF. It gives everybody an opportunity to kind of contribute. Um, if you're a decision maker at a company, or if you're an engineer that's thinking about applying, um, please come and speak to me and I'll help you walk through about how you can apply and possibly have the opportunity yourself. Um, Another standout point from the diversity scholarship and being part of the CNCF community is that community is a big thing. Um, be yourself. Everybody's got something to bring to the table, regardless of your skill set. And that's a really strong point that I hope I can bring across today. So be yourself. Everybody's got something to co contribute. I'm going to make a note that I was also a diversity scholar at my first KubeCon. So it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so the main gist of this, and I don't have any um, technical demos to show you, it's going to be a real cultural kind of exchange today. Um, the long road for me started about five years ago. So a traditional story, I was working as a Wintel engineer, virtualization, application virtualization, a lot of lift and shift into the cloud, mainly Google Cloud. Similar to Kubernetes, we, we was moving the control plane into Google, but we wasn't mo <clears throat> moving the whole environment. So I thought it was getting a bit stale. I wanted to explore more. Um, and looking at the Microsoft environment, I'd been working in that for 15 years. And it felt to me that the next evolution was going to be Windows 11. Um, I'd looked at Azure. It didn't feel really exciting like AWS or GCP. It felt more like an extension of Microsoft into the cloud. So I was looking for a change. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's where my long road started. I looked at myself, my career, and I wanted something new. I wanted a challenge. Um, key point, this is before I knew about SRE as a principle or that type of engineering in the field. So the first start of this is a similar story. A lot of engineers flash up this book, Site Reliability Engineering. It's really cool. It's really informative. The reason why I have Wikipedia at the side is I had both of these open at the same time. Um, SRE book, working through the chapters, but on the other screen, I had Wikipedia. A lot of new principles, a lot of new um, frameworks, a lot of new tools was coming into my vocabulary. And to become, to really embrace SRE, I need to jump between the two to really get engaged. Um, I really do suggest having a look at that book. There's a second book that I'm going to share with you that I think is a bit more powerful for younger engineers, or from someone that's a developer that hasn't worked in operation that wants to make the sidestep. So, the wild, wild west. This is kind of where my journey began. Um, I was working for a media group, um, halfway through a digital transformation. I got an invite to Google Cloud Connect. It was a weekend where Google was working with media organizations and effectively was courting them to kind of use more of their services in GCP. I met an SRE team. Um, it was a real surprise for me. I'd read the book about three times, and it was the first time I'd actually met SREs face to face that I could talk to and ask them, what is it like? What, is it really like the book? So the key thing about that kind of interaction, the SRE team, it was a team of seven. They were supporting 150,000 users internally across the whole uh, Google domain. So all, effectively, all Google's internal users and the contractors, an SRE team of seven was supporting that whole environment. Um, distribution of the email, errors, everything. The cool thing about that, that team, through SRE principles, they'd managed to automate away all the issues in the environment. And um, it might not be true, but the manager's claim to fame for this was that if one or two of his engineers was away for the week, or even for two weeks, the operation would just run, as it were. They'd managed to kind of crack the, the toil. The main thing for that in terms of this story, my inspiration was that the newest member of that team, he had no technical experience. Um, as we all know, getting into Google is really hard. Lots of processes, all that kind of stuff. The team saw in him that he was a good problem solver, um, and they gave him a chance. As part of his um, probation requirement, effectively, he had to learn Go and kind of contribute, and, um, contribute to the team um, but they gave him the opportunity. For me as an engineer coming from Wintel, outside of SRE and Google, I, for me that was like, um, it was inspirational. It gave me the kind of thought inside to say, I can do this. And the same thing for you, to pivot and to move around in tech. Um, it takes determination, but it's doable. So, chapter two. Um, as George Leonard put it in his book, Mastery, and I'm sure this is quite familiar to anybody in any kind of field. Um, humans are people of like routine. Um, for every step you take forward towards mastery, your destination moves two steps further away. Embrace mastery as a lifelong endeavor. Learn to enjoy the journey. Um, I'm still a junior SRE. I'm still going through my journey. Part of me being here is kind of sharing my story to get more people into the profession. But on my long road, moving away from Wintel, I quit my job, I moved into contracting, and I started four different contracts. I was looking for a new challenge. I was looking for environments and cultures that suited my skill set, 
but also pushed me closer to the kind of ideas that I saw in the book, closer to the engineers and the kind of things that I saw at the Google SRE team. So my journey, the second stage was five months, trying to find the right position, the right opportunity to kind of take my foothold and um, take the skills that I'd learned and kind of extend them, augment them in a better way. And that's when this happened, my first role. I should have like a birthday cake or something here. It was really exciting. Um, Condé Nast International, <coughs> excuse me. So when I joined Condé Nast International, it was a, a really refreshing and a, a, a really cool time for the organization. 50 employees. Um, it felt like a startup. They had a strong DevOps culture. However, they was embracing new technologies, new ways of thinking. And SRE was a new team. I was the second member. So it was very exciting for me. Um, coinciding with my, um, the first day that I joined the company, as part of the digital transformation that Condé Nast was ongoing, is um, they have lots of brands, um, some of which you will know, GQ, Vogue, House and Garden, Wired, all familiar brands. However, in terms of technical and from the business side, they was all managed by the separate markets. So France had its own internal system, Italy had its own internal system. As part of platform engineering and SRE, part of our role was to bring all the brands into a unified Kubernetes environment. So for me, that was really exciting as well. It was the first time I'd actually worked in Kubernetes, and I was going to support that in a production environment for a brand which was Vogue, which was something I've always loved throughout my life. Um, another key point, I guess, for this as well, in terms of my first role, I'd moved away from Wintel. I'd worked as a Wintel engineer for 15 years. Um, Windows System 32 was my bread and butter. I had to move to, to slash user slash options, all this kind of stuff. Linux was, I'd used Linux as a Wintel engineer to manage Microsoft environments. So it was, it was really exciting, but really daunting for me. <coughs> so this slide, it's a bit of a mess, but it was my first day. And this is kind of how I felt. I'd used to using um, PowerShell, all these different kind of tools, um, Windows System Config Manager, um, Citrix, VMware, those are the tools that I was logging to every day before this point. And then suddenly, this screen doesn't even really show you, but there was about 50 to 60 applications that I was involved with, where it would be managing, supporting, embedding with a team that would be using these tools. And we had to build dashboards and tools to kind of make the whole environment reliable. Um, to kind of bring it closer to home, to CNCF, I don't know if you've seen the landscape, um, the CNCF landscape of all the different projects that are on there. There's about 150 different um, companies that have got really cool tools like Traffic, Kubernetes, GitHub, Nginx. Um, but for me, it was really daunting but exciting. For every tool I had to manage, I had to learn a new skill set. It was, it was really cool, but it also showed me, a, <clears throat> as part of my long journey, that there was still a lot to learn. For every new tool that I was using and mastering, a new tool was coming into the ecosystem and it provided another option for me to look at. So this is the secret source. And this is part of my journey into SRE, is that chaos engineering is a valuable toolkit for an SRE team. Even for a DevOps team that might not be too concerned about potentially breaking the system, um, Chaos engineering gives you visibility, and for people that like problem solving or really want to test the reliability of the environment, especially when you're using um, services such as GCP or AWS, it's a dependency, and you want to be able to kind of test, is your system resilient to those kind of failures if it was to happen? Um, and I think chaos engineering for an SRE is the next evolution step. Um, maybe not so much at the beginning, but if you're that way inclined, then definitely have a look. So I'm going to kind of round up here and kind of bring some of this to a closure. A few key points. Um, SRE is extremely enjoyable. But at the end of the day, it's an operational job. So when you go home you, or if you go on holiday, you have the pager. You get called at 4 o'clock in the morning. So with the enjoyment comes the stress. Um, second key point. I would kind of consider that mastering SRE is almost like mastering a martial art technique. Um, there's different ways. Everybody might have their own view of what SRE is or how to use a certain tool. But when you work in a community or if you embed in a team, 
you kind of learn within yourself how to master the task and you kind of create a path for yourself. And that goes to the third point. Um, how I kind of fell into SRE to some extent was through a lot of hard work and some luck, but you have to create your own path. Um, look within yourself if you're an engineer, if you're a developer, if you work in marketing, if you work in sales. We've all got skills to bring. We can all contribute and learn new skills. Um, find something that you find enjoyment in and then take it from there. And then this kind of comes from the diversity scholarship where I learned something new last year to kind of extend yourself and for me personally as well. Contribute or create an open source project, put it onto GitHub, let people know about it and kind of work on that and that'll allow you to kind of build your own skills but learn how engineers and SREs kind of work with their code. That is kind of the roundup. So at the end, I have some links. If these are really interesting for you, if you want to kind of follow up, the first one is a link to the meetup that I run. Um, the second link is a book called Apprenticeship Patterns. Um, I would argue that in some respects, this is a stronger book than the SRE book. Um, it kind of, if you're, um, a, this book is kind of specific to programmers. And it's addressing, if you know a language, it kind of challenges you to learn a new language. And for me, at the time in my career, where I was working with Wintel as a platform engineer, I had to learn a new skill set, which was Linux and cloud. And it's got some really cool ideas. And the quote that I took about mastery came from that book. Um, the landing page is for the Google SRE books. There's three of them available now. Um, I highly recommend working your way through all three. Um, Read them at the same time is a good way as well because there's a lot of overlap. Um, and then the last link is a really important one, the awesome SRE. It's a GitHub repo. Um, it's a community, but there's about 150 links. There's tutorials, there's books, there's references. There's so much that will last you for at least two or three years to just kind of invest yourself into. Um, and then I have a profile link for myself if you'd like to connect with me after the talk. Um, can take some questions. Thank you. That's what I found is a very interesting actually, your your background and your speech, your presentation. I started off as a C developer on Unix systems in the nineties. I can't hear the mic. You rest the microphone on your chair. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Yeah, I started off in the 90s uh, as a C Unix developer, analyst programmer on Unix systems, okay? Then in 1996, there I blew up offices in Canary Wharf, then I, I became a full-time systems administrator. The roles you've just specified there are not dissimilar to the roles I currently do as a systems administrator. So what's so differentiating between an SRE I've heard it from Google mates, friends of mine who work for Google, and from IBM friends. They're essentially systems administrators. So what's so different from them? What's so different from... from Between SRE and system admin? Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a strong overlap in both. Um, again, kind of going back to the Wikipedia reference that I met earlier, a lot of the things that I found in the book were things that I was already doing as a Wintel, um, as a Wintel sysadmin. Um, I guess the key difference between SRE and sysadmin is that the first, one of the first key principles is that you want to start monitoring everything. Um, you want to put logs, you want to be monitoring and having kind of, you want to have full visibility. Um, observability is a key point of SRE. It's understanding end-to-end -end the whole application stack so front end, back end, the applications that are getting deployed, the clients, how they're interacting with you, the logs that you're producing. Um, and then I'd say for me, because I came from a similar background, being a sysadmin in Wintel, the major changing point for me was that the, the principle and the idea of automate everything. You have to look at all the scripts that you have, all the processes that you're working as a team and try to solve the business and the technical problems with software, which often means writing new tools and sometimes automating people out of jobs, um, which is one of those things. But automation is a key factor, and monitor everything are the kind of differences, I would say, between a sysadmin. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Um, so I was wondering, um, for, or as I understand, sorry, um, you need some input from management, some from other departments that are not technical, to, uh, basically, uh, to define these SLIs, uh, these uh, service level indicators. Yeah. Uh, how difficult do you find to communicate with these non-technical uh, departments, and how, or which tools, if you use any, uh, or frameworks have you find useful? Um, so the question was about implementing SLIs, and if you have difficulties in working with teams that don't quite understand that. Um, I guess the first thing was embedding as an SRE, depending on the company that you're with, embedding forms a large part of that. So actually sitting down with the application teams or the platform teams and, sitting and explaining to them why these things are important. Um, Difficulties that I ran into was kind of explaining to them to get them to understand why the metrics were so important to us in terms of things like latency. Um, getting the buy-in is really important. So you kind of hit the nail on the head with the first statement that you made. It needs to come from the top. The engineering culture needs to be about collaboration and that kind of openness to new ideas, that kind of blameless culture where people can have ideas and test um, Test things that people thought was kind of set in stone, but you need the buy-in from from the top is a real key point. That's if anything, if anybody was to take anything away from today, if you're going to kind of think about bringing an SRE function into your business, the buy-in really has to come in from the top, and it has to be all the way through, all the way down to the bottom. Um, and communication is a key factor. <laughs> explaining to people a, a, a key um, thing that I've run into as a dev as an SRE is what is the difference between SRE and DevOps, and sometimes it means again sitting down with the engineers and explaining to them why these things are important because sometimes they don't even know what SRE is. So it's, it's, it takes time. It's a cultural shift as well, as much as anything. Um, and also with this uh, SLIs. Um, uh, do you feel that the ownership, or they feel like the ownership is shared, or is more yours? It's, it's culture, um, and the business, again, it depends on, for the SLIs, the SLIs for a bank is going to be very different from a social media app. So the kind of business and the kind of data that you're serving is going to inform the SLIs that you create. And then again, the culture within the team is going to really inform that as well. Um, there's, there's a lot of kind of factors that you have to kind of take into consideration when doing this. Um, but yeah, those are the kind of things you need to think about for sure. Um, and again, with SLIs, they're not set in stone. A, a really cool thing about creating SLIs, you can have one, run it for a month or two, and then get, huddle the team back up and have a review and see if you need to adjust it. So there's options there. It's a learning experience as well. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, as an SRE, uh, just trying to understand your roles, like say something happens, like some monitoring issue, do you happen uh, to go and fix the issue or else you just pass on to the development team? So what would be your yeah. role and responsibility okay, when, as and when you get an issue? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so SRE, it kind of fits two purposes within a company in terms of engineering. Your engineering solutions, again, you're embedding, you're pairing with different teams and building the instrumentation for them. Um, so I've lost my train of thought. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah. So what, do you happen to go and do the fix? Or else you just oh. pass it on to the development team, or else your production team? Like, what would be your role? Okay. Yeah, you're very much an operational team. So you're engineering solutions. So um, before the actual issues occur, you're working hard to kind of remediate them and make sure that they don't happen. When they do happen, you have the pager. Again, your operations, um, if there's an issue, you're going to get paged, someone's going to call you, and you're going to have to run through the run books and start fixing the issue. So there's a lot of pressure. Um, but again, as an engineering team, you spend a lot of time beforehand looking at the environment, monitoring, having a look at what systems are working with each other, and try to remediate those issues before they happen. Or if you're a strong, mature team, what you can do is you can automate those issues away. So if you have alerts at 4 o'clock in the morning, the system will take care of it for you and repair itself. So there's options again. 
and you mentioned about automation right a uh, few times like uh, i'm just trying to understand like wh- what is the right time okay to start automation okay yeah. like before release or after we release uh so yeah exactly. very good question Aut- automation when when it's the best place for your team um as early as possible i would say um if you have for example a script that creates say like um a load balancer then there's no reason why you couldn't have that in as an automated script that the machine can take care of for you um again it's have it's having the awareness to look at the whole environment and make those kind of conscious decisions at that point um but as early as possible if you can script it or if you can codify it if you think about things like gitops if you treat your infrastructure as code then the machine can run it for you and you it takes some of the pressure away and you can focus on other areas that you might need to spend more engineering effort and uh, what monitoring tool do you recommend like we, we got splunk okay elk okay like what's your experience which tool do you really recommend okay um i stack driver is still comfortable with the, with a google cloud for yeah. example stack driver for example are you comfortable with cloud cloud products or else you still want to go with external products oh yeah external products so similar to some of the screenshots um kibana prometheus and grafana are really cool um I'm building a lot of um infrastructure in Kubernetes so things like Istio is really cool because that ties in with the whole service mesh and gives you that kind of telemetry and the metrics um depending on the stack that you're using depending on the application is going to all inform the decisions about the type of kind of logging that you can instrument um some applications and some kind of platforms they don't have the connectors to connect to some logging systems as well so you kind of have to work around and that's the fun of an SRE kind of going back to the screenshot of all the different tools depending on your platform you can pick and choose the best tool for the job and it doesn't have to be the one that's provided by the provider or even from the application itself you could push it out to another logging system okay thanks sir yeah. So you emphasized automation a few times. How much an average SRE's time is spent on uh, coding and um, scripting? Um very hard to say. It is very dependent on the actual team and the kind of platform and the application that you're supporting. Um to kind of give you a, a kind of a better answer what I would say is that as an SRE team you want to be spending as much time on the automation early to kind of free up that kind of i wouldn't say it's fun time but the experimental time where you as a team can look at other issues of the stack that might need more attention um but it's really hard to gauge SRE is like a devops team it depends on the culture the organization um you might be in an SRE team where you're constantly firefighting and you just don't have the time to kind of do that so it's a case by case basis but um the more time you can invest in automation frees up your time to look at more interesting issues okay i have one more quick question um how much do you work with the security team or did you work with them at all uh extensively i was studying ethical hacking for 7 years so um devsecops is another string to mabo um but as an sre team again talking about end to end life cycle the whole monitor everything and being aware of the whole infrastructure um as an SRE to some extent you work like an architect where you're designing the environment but also as an engineer where you're building the tools so it it works it kind of fits together thank you hello hi <laughs> um I made my way path a little bit similar uh, like a from sys admin to SRE and uh, so I understand all, the mic is a bit low sorry all right much better much better all right yeah. so mike i have two very simple questions however the, the the i would like to have your um approach to this as we know agile usually means that developers are writing software and then they will create the documentation or even if they have a time to write the documentation this is problem from my perspective as a um, engineer who is on call lo- looking for 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 you know to take care of the system that something was introduced something was added and usually it was like added like a two days ago and now it's not working <laughs> and is in the middle of the night 
how what's the, how you tackle the the problem of the keep a track or have a documentation to the, to debug the the problem or make make the system back back to back on feed because as we know this is not not easy task but it's something to introduce I know it's a more culture thing yeah. but the question is how um, how do you, you know, how you approach this how you see the, the, this as a solution um, I have two quick answers for that actually. The first one is kind of like embedding with the teams. Again, trying to get a bit more familiarity. Um, number two, and it, that might not sound like it addresses that, but if you're working with the team quite closely, and again, it comes down to the culture and the organization, you might be able to have a look at their repo and work with them in terms of creating the run books and ensuring that the SRE team has the ability to kind of work on these issues if there's an outage or if there's an issue. Um, the second thing is game days. Similar to chaos engineering, they allow you to programmatically, um, and maybe not programmatically, but with some kind of, oops, apologies. They allow you, apologies. Um, with game days, they allow you to, to test your procedures. So if you've got run books, if you, you need, you've got a Slack channel that you might need to call external engineers, by actually putting these things into practice where you're testing, your presumptions will allow you to make better informed decisions. Then you can have a post-mortem, get everybody in the room and change the way. Um, when you're doing things like CI and CD and you're doing like daily releases potentially, those kind of changes it's going to be impossible to track. Um, I've heard of companies doing self-documented um, um, runbooks, which is something that you could actually look into possibly in your own time, but that seems like possibly the future. Or maybe GitOps where everything is pushed into a Git repo and everybody's got oversight of that. And as an SRE team, you'd want to ensure that you've got the access to kind of have a look at what's going on. But um, from operations, and I've had that issue before where changes have been made even the day before, even by someone on my team that hasn't done the correct handover, um, you're never going to get 100% reliability. And when you start solving issues, there's always going to be issues. And it's part of the fun about being an SRE to some extent. If you like the adrenaline, it might be four o'clock in the morning, the run book's out of date, and you have to kind of fix the issue. But um, there's that as well, so yeah. All right, thank you very much. And uh, um, if I can, the second question. Uh, but as we know, when you, after, you know, nightly debugging, where when you, the next day in the morning, you are not like a, the most you know, people person, let's say like this. How you approach the problem of the little bit burning, uh, burning yourself out too, in, the, in the work, Especially not for the daily daily basis, but um, try try to find find your, your balance in in terms of the as a SRE, you have a lot to hit on your shoulders because you are basically you are the, like a front facing of the person who when it's just like why my thing do, doesn't work, so this is a little bit daunting. Yeah. So how, how you approach that? Thank um, you. I think that's quite a personal question because everybody's going to kind of treat those kind of issues in their own way. Um, but more practically, um, the way that you can do that is call a team meeting, speak to the, the manager of your team, and express your concerns. Kind of going back to the firefighting question, if it's like an environment where you're getting stressed out, then things need to change. Um, but you have to open your mouth and um, get the team together. Working in operations, there's a lot of trust especially when you're working in a, on code and there's like outages. So it's best to be upfront and get it out there, make your feelings known to the team, and then work as a team to kind of resolve that. One final quick question. Where do companies get, us, where do companies get SRE wrong or how do they misunderstand SRE in your opinion? Um, I think it's in the implementation. Um, SRE is such a, it can be misconstrued and it's kind of the way that you, um, the way that you introduce SRE into, or, into your organization is very culturally led and also it kind of, it's kind of dictated on the engineering environment that you have. For example, um, I'm working in financial services. 
there's a large adoption to move to cloud and SRE, but the historical frameworks that they have in place and some of the systems don't suit SRE and that kind of working. Um, but again, it's kind of like a case by case. It, a lot of it is culture driven for SRE. Um, I hope that kind of addresses some point of your answer. Awesome. Round of applause, please, for Jai. Amazing. So that concludes us for tonight. Thank you to all of our speakers for this evening. We'll be back again on the first Wednesday of March. Thank you very much. Oh. And uh, if you want to go to the pub now, we're going to the Draft House, which is just around the corner. Hopefully I'll see a few of you there. <laughs>